Welcome everybody. My name is Myrna Masonette. I'm the Chief Diversity Officer uh, for Greenspan Martyr and I'm also uh, the employment uh, partner. Uh, our law firm is very happy, very excited to welcome you today to Brave Little Cookie, the webinar, a discussion about racism, breaking barriers and healing. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to just kind of go over some housekeeping uh, uh, things. And uh, first, we're going to have a discussion with Dr. Bracey. We want to make this organic. So uh, at the beginning, we're going to be having her uh, talk to us. Uh, and then if you have any questions, go to your lower, uh, the bottom of the screen. It has a chat, uh, I'm sorry, a Q&A section. If you have the questions there, please go to the Q&A section. And then uh, 20 minutes into the beginning of the uh, chat, Ms. Uh, Dr. Bracey is going to be asking, uh, it's going to be answering some questions. Uh, let me just introduce you. I am extremely excited. I know Dr. Bracey, she is very lovely and she's very smart and is somebody that I look up to uh, as a woman and, and, and as a person because she has done what many of us uh, have never done is in, in encounter racism and had the courage to stand up uh, at a great cost. Um, Dr. Bra uh, LaVon Wright Bracey, she's been a champion of civil rights. Uh, she has been involved since very young in the civil rights movement. And the reason why we invited her to uh, speak for us here is because we wanted to have a, a substantive and honest dialogue. Uh, and you know, she is the right person to do it. She lived through this, uh, the civil rights. She has dealt with the racism the entirety of her life. And more importantly, she has learned uh, and, and believes in dialogue one person at a time. So that without further ado, I wanna introduce you to Dr. Lavon Wright Bryce. And uh, Dr. Bryce, uh, to get started, can you give us a, a brief, you know, background of where you came from and the events leading to writing uh, the, the book, Brave Little Cookie? Okay, thank you so much, uh, Myrna, for that introduction. And then I'd like to thank the Greenspoon Martyr Law Office for having this much needed discussion. So let me just give you a little background as to who I am. Uh, I lived when I was young in St. Augustine and all of you knew, know that St. Augustine uh, is the oldest city in the United States. My dad was a preacher, my mom was a school teacher. My dad felt that since St. Augustine was the oldest place in the United States that it needed to be a role model for the nation. Things needed to be changed in St. Augustine. He was president of the NAACP and he felt that uh, this was during the segregation era that St. Augustine was not being fair to African-Americans and, uh, and people of color, of all colors. So dad would go to city council meetings and he would go to school board meetings and said that you aren't spending any resources in the African-American community and it's just not fair. So dad would consistently go to these meetings and he was labeled as a troublemaker because he continued to go and people continued to say no to him. Mom was such a good school teacher and she enjoyed her job but she knew that things were tense in St. Augustine. Well, the powers that be told my dad that he needed to stop what he was doing. Or either our family would feel the effects of the work that he was trying to get done. Dad ignored everything that he was told. And sooner or later, my mom was called in by her principal and told that uh, she, her, her services were no longer needed. She was being fired because that the school board had said that they were instructed to fire her because of my dad's uh, activities. So it was, it was four children in our family and now, and we were accustomed to a two parent family. Now my mother does not have a job. So she goes to look for another job. 
She finds a job in the city called Bunnell, which is about 35 miles from St. Augustine. It really kind of disrupts the flow of the family because mom had to get up very early to be in Bunnell by eight o'clock in the morning. She has now another teaching job. My dad continues his work uh, trying to get things change and speaking truth to power. So mom stays at uh, Bunnell for about a year and the principal calls her in again and says, Ms. Wright, you are an excellent reading teacher, but I have been instructed that I have to fire you because of your husband's activity. So mom loses her second job. She comes and tells my dad that we need to leave St. Augustine because she doesn't know where else she could go. Things are very tense. Uh, my dad said that she would find a job he didn't know where. Things got so bad that the Ku Klux Klan decided to burn a cross in front of our house. When that happened, my mother gave my dad an ultimatum. Either we will leave St. Augustine, or I will leave you here by yourself to fight the cause. So dad uh, wrote a letter to Martin Luther King asking him to come to St. Augustine because things were so tense. So Martin Luther King did come to St. Augustine. We left St. Augustine by, by night. Uh, my mother instructed us while we were leaving St. Augustine for us to lay down in the car. She said, because if the Ku Klux Klan was following us, they would only see one person. We left St. Augustine and we moved to Gainesville, Florida. My mother gets the third teaching job. She asked my dad, promise me, you will not join the NAACP and we will live like normal human beings. You will pastor the church. I will be a school teacher and our life will be normal. My dad promised my mother that is exactly what's gonna happen. And that is what happened for about two months. Uh, my mother was going to church one morning and a lady stopped her and said, oh, Miss Wright, we are delighted that uh, Reverend Wright is now the president of the NAACP in Gainesville. We are going to turn Gainesville upside down. My mom was livid because my dad had promised her he would not get involved. So dad says, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do this for one year. And then after that, you can be assured I wouldn't have, I'm not going to have any more activities with the NAACP. Well, the one year turned into 18 years. So now dad is president of the NAACP in Gainesville, Florida. So he goes around to see what are the needs in Gainesville, Florida. This is 1964. It was 1954 when Brown versus the Board of Education passed. So 10 years have passed and Gainesville's public schools are still segregated. So dad goes to the school board meeting and, and asks when will the schools uh, integrate? And he was told it might be another 10 years uh, because we don't feel that the climate is right. So we aren't gonna do anything. Dad said, fine. So dad uh, filed a suit with the NAACP to sue the Alachua County School Board and the NAACP won the suit. Then uh, the judge had indicated that they had to integrate with all deliberate speed. So now the schools need to integrate. So dad is trying to decide what strategy do I use to now get students to move from the all black school to the all white school. So he says, I have, a, I have a plan. I'm gonna start with 10th, 11th and 12th graders because if I start with 12th graders, I will then have a graduation the very next year. 
So he began to knock on doors, asking parents to move their kids from the all black school to the all white school. He knocked on about 500 doors. He found one 10th grader, one 11th grader, and no 12th grader. So that was so distraught. He says, I've done all this work and now I can't find a 12th grader that will go to the all white school. I was in the 12th grade. My brother was in the 12th grade. So I asked my brother, I said, listen, why don't we go to the all white school? Dad will be so happy and we'll be in the class together. We were not twins. I had skipped a grade and that's why we were in the same grade. So my brother said to me, listen, I don't care how sad and upset dad is. I am a senior. I'm in the student council. I'm in the band and I have three girlfriends. There is no way that I'm going to leave my three girlfriends and go over there to the all white school and nobody wants me over there. I'm not going so dad can still be sad. So I couldn't get my, bro my brother to go. So I just anguished over it and I just thought about it. And I told dad, here I am, send me. I'll go to the all white school. He said, well, fine. He said, we can't tell your mom this just yet because she won't be very happy. So when mom would see dad and I talking, she, she knew something was up. And she told my dad, if you think LaVon is going over there to the all white school, she is not. So it took him all of the summer to convince her that I needed to be go to the all white school. Dad said that he could not ask other parents to do what he was not willing to do himself. So mother reluctantly says yes, until the FBI comes to the house and asks that my dad, if he would postpone this for three or four years because the climate wasn't right in Gainesville and that they could not guarantee our protection. Dad said you had 10 years to do this and you didn't do anything. Absolutely not. So the, the FBI says, well, several things have to be done. Number one, can you take the three students to school every day? Dad said, yes. And he told us as students that we could not gather in any kind of way where there would be a crowd said we couldn't go to any basketball games, any football games, could not go to the prom, anything where the people would congregate. We could not go because they could not guarantee our safety. I said, we understood that. So here we are, mother has said no all over again. So dad has to start to convince her all over again after the FBI leaves. Now she says finally, yes. So it's time for school to start. The night before school, I did not sleep. I did not sleep because I didn't know what the next day would look like. I, uh, I, was, I anguished in bed, I tossed, I turned, and I got up and I was ready three hours before school was to start. Mom got up early, fixed me a big breakfast, but I couldn't eat, I just, uh, I was so nervous. I just had some juice and she said, listen, LaVon, if they aren't nice to you, just kill them with kindness. And my dad took the three of us to school. We were escorted by the Gainesville police, one in front and one in back. We got to the school, dad had a prayer with us and told us to have a good day. The 10th grader went to class, the 11th grader went to class. And as I was going to my class, I was stopped by six white students saying to me, we don't want you here, that you are going to ruin our class if you stay here. And if you decide to stay, it's gonna be hell on earth because we're going to show you that we don't want you. 
They spit on me. They called me the N-word. I kept walking and I went to my class. I sat in the first row on the first seat. And as I sat down, the entire class got up, went to the other side. The teacher says, why are you standing? And they said, we would rather stand than to sit by the N-word. So they stood. Every day that I would go to class, I would get to my seat. There would be tacks in my seat. Under my seat would be dead roaches, dead rats, dead snakes, and would be a nasty, horrible letter uh, saying that they don't want me there. And if I continued to stay, they would kill me. There were 550 people in my class. I had no, no one because no one befriended me while I was there. The hardest part of the day was trying to navigate how I would go to the restroom. I knew that when classes uh, were exchanging, I could not go in the bathroom because I would be attacked. So I'd have to go to the, to the class wait for about 10 minutes, ask for a pass, run to the bathroom and run back before the students knew that I had, had been, I, that I had gone. I did this and so I then decided I needed to watch my liquid intake. So I tried to, during the day, watch my liquid intake so that I wouldn't have to go to the restroom more than once a day. So that happened to me every day, uh, a day of silence, a day no, no one speaking to me unless they're spitting in my very face and calling me the N-word. So I kind of got used to the silent treatment until one day I get to school, six boys decided to jump me. They beat me unmercifully. Um, I have stitches from the front of my head to the back of my head today from the beating that I took from those guys. Uh, I stood, I, I was on the ground. The bell had not rung. When the bell rang, all of the students passed by. Not one student stopped. They saw me bleeding. And I thought that was in fact gonna be the last day on earth for me. I waited until all the students were in their classes. I stumbled to the principal's office. I was bleeding profusely, told the principal that I had been attacked. The principal said, how do I know you didn't leave home like that? I didn't see anybody attack you. And if by chance they did, then you ought to know that you're unwelcome and you need to go back to where you belong. So I asked the principal, may I use the telephone? He says, absolutely not. This is long before cell phones. So I stumbled across the street to a pay phone. It's a red booth and you go in there and you put 10 cents and you make a phone call. I, I did that, called my dad, told him I had been attacked. Dad took me to the only black doctor in Gainesville at the time. The doctor stitched me up and said, you know, you've been beaten pretty badly. You need to go home and mend. So as we were going home, I said, dad, I don't think I'm going back to school. He says, you don't have to go back. He says, if you don't want to go back, you can go back to the all black school. So I stayed home about four or five days. Then I said, dad, take me back to school. He said, I thought you weren't going back to school. I said, you know what? If I don't go back to school, they win. I can't afford to let them win. I'm going back to school. And if they kill me, they just kill me. I'm going back to school. I went back to school and they redoubled their efforts. They gave more tax, more, I mean, and instead of having one or two snakes, they had three or four snakes and they just, they just got horrible because graduation was nearing 
and I was still in school. During all of this, my teachers tried their best to flunk me as well because they didn't want me there. And so they did all they could so that they were trying to stop me from graduating. But since I transferred with about a 3.839 average, it was almost impossible for them to actually flunk me and not me, and not be, me being able to graduate. So here it is now, it's time for graduation. I, they have put these threats out everywhere. Since we didn't kill her during the year, we're gonna kill her at graduation. So graduation time, my brother and my graduation is on the same day. So I tell my parents, listen, I don't have to march. Let us go to Phil's graduation and we just forget about mine. And my mother said, all the hell you've been through, you're gonna graduate, you're gonna march. So I could not tell them why I didn't want to go to graduation, but my mother insisted that I graduate. So my mother went to my brother's and my graduation was at the University of, of Florida in the McConnell Center. So my dad takes me to uh, the McConnell Center. When I get there, there are police everywhere. I didn't know if they were there because this was the first black graduating, or if in fact they were there because they knew what uh, had been said and the threats that were made. So here we are. And dad said, get out of the car and go. I was afraid because I didn't want to line up with them. I just thought that uh, I would be killed that night. Well, I got in the line. I graduated, uh, went across the stage without incident. So after graduation, dad says, now that we've done that, let's go to the University of Florida. And I said to dad, I said, dad, I need to go somewhere where I am in the majority and not in the minority. I need to go somewhere where I can heal, and that people really love me and they will understand who I am. So I left high school and I went to a historically black institution, Fish University in Nashville, Tennessee. I went there so that I could heal from the traumatic experience of my high school days. I'll stop right there. Dr. Racy, I, you know, you made me cry. I'm sure you made everybody else cry. I, uh, these are the moments that I hate that we're doing Zoom because I would love to give you a hug and get a hug from you because boy, don't mess with Dr. Bracy. Now, how old were you when that happened? When it's you were I, I, When I finished high school, I was 16 years old. Uh, this happened 56 years ago. And some of the same problems that I was dealing with 56 years ago, we are currently dealing with them in 2021. And I wanted to get to that because it seems with uh, issues of race, they're legal wins, but the actual substantive work is lagging behind. Um, for you, you mentioned Brown versus Board of Education was in 1954. It wasn't magically, racism didn't magically appear and segregation didn't magically disappear. Um, there were still pockets and there were still a lot of places where you know this then continue. So let me ask you a question. Uh, before we get into the future, how do you overcome that kind of hatred because I don't really think anybody certainly that we know have gone through that without being um, scarred and, and you know how do you not go from the you know the dark side that says no I'm just gonna hate these people uh, and what they represent and everybody that is like them 
what make you, because I, I know that you said you went through a transition. How did you, how did you engage in the healing and how did the healing come about? And, and, and how, 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 how was that journey where you are able now to talk about that experience and share it and, and start a dialogue when something as tragic as that uh, was well, um, that? Since, since this is an open and honest conversation, I must admit, I left high school very angry and hostile toward white people because my, I, I said that there is no, they have no legitimate reason to hate me. I have a legitimate reason to hate them after the abuse that I have been through. However, I am convinced that uh, racism is an adult problem and we must uh, need to stop infecting children. And I say that because I just believe that parents sat at their table at dinner time uh, with no basis whatsoever in stealing into it to their children. There's a black girl at that school. You need not befriend her. You need to dislike her and gave her gave them reasons uh, to dislike me because of my background with my father being a minister, my mom being a school teacher, and te the teachings that I got uh, when I was young in terms of loving thy enemy, being good to those who despitefully use you. I use those things that I was brought up with to say that I am not going to hate like they hate me. I'm going to demonstrate a love and a care for people, all people. And what I really learned out of that experience is being silent for an entire year, I left there promising that I'd never be silent again. And I would always speak truth to power. So I learned and I, I went into a wonderful community when I went to, went to college. I found students that really genuinely loved me for who I was. I, I, I developed friendships for a lifetime. I was able to talk about the experience. I was able to uh, share my concerns and I was able to heal as a result of that. Thank you very much. We have a question, it's kind of related, but um, I just want to make sure uh, I ask it. What gave you the strength to keep pressing forward? Uh, I, I just kept saying that I am going to be bigger than they are. And I'm going to, I am going to be successful and I am not going to let this experience define the rest of my life. And I just had to make sure that I did and I would use this experience to talk about so that we can have some real serious dialogues about racism and about what is happening then and now. And how do you talk? To, I know that you have two wonderful children. I, I know LaVon personally and as Senator uh, Wright as well. I don't know him, but how do you talk to your children about racism when you're facing still some of the same issues, not perhaps as blatantly, but as a black man, I think, you know, uh, as a mother of a black child, especially a black man, you have to be concerned about their safety in light of all the issues that we've been having. What, how do you converse with your kids about this ongoing issue? You know, even when my kids were young, we would have conversations. I would, uh, we spent uh, a, a large portion of their youth in Philadelphia. And I would sit both of my kids down and would always say to them, if you are stopped by the police, this is how you respond. Give no information. You have, you have, you can make one phone call, you call your parents and let them know what what is happening. I've had to, my son 
who is a state senator. We've had many conversations and right to this day, him traveling from Orlando to Tallahassee, most of the time I talked to him for an hour, hour and a half as he passed through some of those places going to Tallahassee. And he is a state senator. And I said, what happens to you if you are stopped by a police for just today? And he would say to me, he says, you know what I do, mom? He says, I give them my driver's license with my state Senate ID. And I says, you have a state Senate ID, but what happens to the average person who doesn't have that kind of identification? You have to recognize that there are some serious issues. Uh, there, are, there are serious issues of how African-Americans are treated and particularly African-American males. And we have to address the problem but you also have to prepare your children for what might happen in the event that you have a confrontation. Thank you. I, I have another question here from um, one of our partners. Um, what is the most important thing you want someone to take away and learn from your experience that can help us make a change today? Um, that's the first part. And the second part is, um, well, let's, let's just answer that part if you can. Um, what is the most important thing I want you to take away is that we all have a responsibility to do something and make certain that things that are happening now will never happen again. I know uh, my neighbor, uh, when, when George Floyd was murdered so that all of us could see it. And my neighbor came over, uh, who happens to be a white male, very, very upset about what he had just, had just witnessed. And when he finished, he said, we, he, something needs to be done. And my question to him was, what are you gonna do? what are you going to do? And he didn't know how to respond. He said, I said, we have to work together to make certain that something is done in a positive way uh, so that this racism that we see, if you're going to remain silent and say nothing, then those who are in charge are those who are actually doing uh, these violent acts will assume that it's all right. Um, thanks so much for that. I, I have a bunch of questions here. I want to try to get at many of them. Um, the you, you touch on the point of what can we do? And one of the reasons why we're here is because we have gotten that question. Um, as people of color, people are not of color, how do I talk to my children? Because you are right, the children, we have to teach our children so they can grow up and stand up and, and, and see that. But how do we go about doing that in a productive way? I know uh, for everybody that is asking questions, Dr. Lavon Bracy has kindly offered her email and we're going to show her at the end of the, um, the presentation. So you can ask her some questions if we don't get to that. But if you can um, answer that, if you can tell us, how do we start that dialogue with people from different races that haven't shared an experience, but it's a dialogue that is needed more now than ever? Well, I mean, we need a, we need a call to action. We need to, to make certain that when we begin to have a dialogue, uh, we need to expose the uh, persons to what it is like. Uh, and, and many of uh, many Europeans have no clue what it is like uh, when you live in an America that 
you aren't treated fairly. So I, I think we have to have a call to action saying that let's all get involved. Let's, let's do some mentoring of, of, of kids that perhaps don't look like the kids that you have in your house. Let's talk to them. Let's discuss some of the real issues as to why this, this problem still persists as it does today. And I think if we can have some serious dialogues about that, we'll begin to see some progress that's been made. Now, um, do you, um, if you can, not for now, but if you have any resources where we can go um, in, in the form, I know that you have the book, uh, Brave Little uh, Cookie, which uh, you didn't mention, but your daddy, you, they used to call you Cookie. And, yes, and that that's what, and yes. that's what the title. Yes. If you can give us some of those resources and we will put them out. Um, what can company leaders do to ensure diverse employees feel safe, com comfortable, and appreciated in the, in the well, corporations? The first thing is they need to be hired. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, companies need not to make excuses why they can't find someone qualified and they don't have uh, any they can't, they've, they've looked, first of all, we need to make certain that we hire them. And secondly, we need to make sure that we take the time to train them properly like we do everybody else and let them know that we want them to win. We want them to be successful. And I think that if these large companies can have settings where they talk about diversity and where they talk about some of the real issues that some of their employees may have in a candid situation and as to how to solve those problems, you can get, go a long way. Now, I don't know, I, I, because I know this is a law firm and I, I know that uh, even just in Orlando, you have the FAMU Law School. Uh, a number of lawyers. I don't know if there are any lawyers from FAMU Law School, part of your law firm, but I know that I, I think that the large firms need to invest in diversity and make it of such that they just don't have a sprinkling, but their, their agencies look like America. And when it looks like America, I think that they will get along better. But I just think that the conversations have to be uh, not surface conversations, but real conversations that talk about uh, systemic racism and uh, what we can really do to make America a better place for everybody. We have somebody from, I guess, Nashville that says, I live in Nashville. I believe you have attended Fisk about five years after the famous Nashville sit-ins. How was the atmosphere in Nashville at the time compared to Gainesville at the time you were here and how were you treated by the community outside of Fisk? Okay, when I was in Nashville, I had left, when I had left high school and I got to Fisk, and I uh, decided that I, I was going to speak truth to power. And I had a group of persons who we, we were considered that we were, going to, we were going to change Nashville for the better. So we were very uh, aggressive in terms of what we thought needed to be done uh, in the city of Nashville. However, uh, the president and others at the school wanted to make sure that we didn't get into a lot of trouble because uh, the sit-ins happened five years before I got there. That's a Yes. Go ahead. Uh -huh. No, I, it happened before I was I was there. Um, I have the three versions of this question, and I I think it's important. Um, so I'm kind of gonna try to uh, combine them. As a white parent. How do I go about teaching my white kids about racism? Um, you know, I know that you touched on some, but um, 
that is something obviously you know one of the reasons why we're having this dialogue is because we want to have an honest dialogue we don't believe diversity is you know check my numbers you know that's not what diversity inclusion means uh, you you want to have people from diverse backgrounds you you want to see more faces like america but you also want to talk about the hard subjects like this because if we don't talk to each other how are we going to get resolve this so one of the things that we we wanted is how do I go about talking to my child who is not black, who's not a person of color uh, about racism? And where do I go uh, for resources if I need to talk um, to do it in a way that is productive? Well, if they're small children, uh, uh, get my book, Brave Little Cookie, and it will give you an opening to talk about <laughs> <laughs> talk about uh, uh, racism. If they're older kids, we, we have to be honest with history. You know, no one wants to talk about slavery. No one wants to talk about how African-Americans got to this country. Uh, no one wants to talk about how we were separated uh, from our parents and what happened as a result of it, how we were beaten. But if you really want to have an honest dialogue, I think you have to look at 400 years ago as to what really happened and uh, tell our children that America made a huge mistake and still needs to apologize for what happened during slavery. And as a result of what has happened there, we have had some institutional problems that we have not addressed. Well, I'm glad that you uh, brought that up because that's the one of the questions that I've been asked. You said, uh, I, I need, we need a call of action. Is this call of action being taken to school and made a part of the curriculum so that this education encompasses all children of all ages? Um, Obviously, as you know, uh, the state of Texas controls most of the textbooks uh, because of the size. So the, the, the history sometimes of racism is sanitized. Uh, you obviously, as an educator, uh, where do you see that needing to change and going to change? Well, number one, we first have to recognize that black history is American history and that it needs to be incorporated in the curriculums of all of the schools. Uh, the state of Florida did make some advances uh, this past session when they have decided that they are going to talk about the uh, massacre of Okoy and make that a part of the curriculum uh, so that kids will know what happened 100 years ago in a small city called Okoy, right outside of Orlando. That's just one example, but we need to make certain that in all of our curricula, that we include black history as part of the curriculum so that students, when they learn, they will learn not only just uh, that Columbus supposedly discovered America, but they will learn about what happened 400 years ago. Um, I have a question. Uh, how would you, um, it's kind of a fill in the blank. How would you fill in the blank of if only he or she said or did, it would be a better world today? If only he or she said. Well, if only he or she said, well, Positive. Or did, or did, did, uh, or only he or she did. Well, if only he or she did the right things toward all people, it would be a better world today. Um, I, the other question—that's actually true. If we were kind to each other and respectful to each other, it would really be a better world. <laughs> um. Um, okay, I have another question. How, I'm just trying to phrase this here because I have a combination of, 
Um, how do you see what has progressed in the uh, race of, uh, you know, in the, the journey for general, I mean, racial equality and what still needs to go further? Okay. So I think what happened in, and I don't want to be political, but this, if we're going to have a candid conversation, I have to be honest. I think what happened in America that in 2008, uh, to, when, when Barack Obama became president, uh, America felt that we had made so many strides and now things are equal and there are no problems. And that was truly not the case whatsoever. Uh, during that time, you had more hate groups that came out of the closet because of the fact that he was president. So I think, yes, we have made some political um, progress in those areas in terms of positions, but there are still some laws that uh, adversely affect people of color. Um, the criminal justice system, uh, there are two criminal justice systems. There's one that deals with the poor and there's one that deals with the wealthy. And that system needs to be revised so that all people, regardless to what might happen, what you have done in a crime should be treated the same. And it, is, it just does not happen in America. And we know that. Uh, police brutality is on the rise. And we have to recognize that. I recognize that we have some excellent police, those in blue that support uh, and do their jobs very well. But we have some in those positions who uh, have not been trained properly and we need to get rid of them. And, 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 you know, I, I look at what happened to Breonna Taylor. And what happened to Breonna Taylor? They went to her house unannounced. And, well, you know, she got killed. I just know that had she been white, that would not have happened. That just would not have happened. They, they would not have had a search warrant uh, that they did not have to advertise or introduce who they were and that that would not have happened if they were going into the white community. It just would not have happened. And for those who just see that incident as a terrible accident, it's more than just a terrible accident. It would not have happened had it been on the other side of town. And we know that. Um, I do have another, I have several more questions. So I'm trying to get as many as we can uh, before we hit our, our time. Uh, have you written any other books? Uh, I was a member of the congregation in Philadelphia and I think so. That's a question. Yeah, okay, yes. I, I wrote a book in Philadelphia when I was in Philadelphia, uh, making them whole. And um, I was working in um, Mayor Good's cabinet at the time. And it was during the time that they had uh, the fire on Osage, Osage where 13 people were killed. And I wrote this book because after the fire and 335 people were displaced, the mayor sent me to talk to 335 residents who had lost everything uh, because of this massive fire. And uh, I decided just to write down and keep a record of everything that was going on, going on at that time. 
And once we rebuilt their houses and got them into another area, I wrote the book called Making Them Whole. And I uh, took the proceeds that I made in that book and I gave scholarships to all of those kids who were in the area that had lost their homes. That was in 1985. Thank you so much. Um, I do have a question here. Um, you mentioned that there needs to be an, an apology about obviously the, the long history of racism starting you know, from, from the time um, that, uh, well, the treatment of Native Americans and then the, obviously the slavery and issues like that. Should that apology be just a verbal uh, dissertation or economic reparations? Uh, and uh, what can be done to bridge the wealth the uh, uh, difference between the white and black Americans or people of color? Okay, uh, number one, uh, they, can, they can stop redlining. Redlining, you think uh, used to happen and it still happens today that, we, that more African Americans and people of color can become uh, homeowners because that is the way that you accrue wealth. Uh, we can really uh, promote increase in the minimum wage so that people can have a decent uh, life. And do I think that it only has to be verbal? No, I, I believe that some reparations are due. Um, and all these are fascinating topics and, and <laughs> that topic itself can be uh, three days. Yes, uh, yes. And I, I, and, I, and I think when we talk about reparations, uh, I, I, I think that one way that reparations can be uh, repaid is that if we looked at the historically black colleges and presented them with some kind of incentives that we can make it available and educate other kids. There are many kids who would like the desire of going to college and cannot afford it. And so I'm not, I don't believe that we should take reparations and try to divide that we have uh, 40 million African Americans and let's give all of them a thousand dollars. No, I don't think that way. But I do think that if we utilize the historically black institutions and uh, presented them with some decent funding so that they will be in a position to educate uh, the, the, the many students who would love the opportunity to go to school. Thanks. And um, we're getting close to the end. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of these questions together. So bear with me. Okay. How, do you, how do you address people who, who want to or wish to minimize racism by comparing their own life experiences when, when talking about racism? Well, <laughs> you know, and, and, I, and I, have, I have met many of them that do that. Uh, and, and they, because they don't want to deal with the reality of what has happened. And I just think that you have to uh, remind them uh, that what, regardless of what has happened in their situation is nothing like what has happened to African-Americans. And I think you have to keep that on the forefront and don't let them minimize it and don't let them tell you that things are so much better now and it couldn't have been all that, but it was all of that. Um, we, we discussed that, uh, you, um, with respect to your education, you went, uh, you went ahead and, 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 and got your doctorate degree, right? In education. Yeah. I went to, uh, I went to the university of Florida and I didn't go when I, you know, I went to college and then I went to university of Miami, got a master's, waited a few years. And then I went to university of Florida when it was, a uh, little, little bit more palatable for African-Americans to be there in 1970. A full circle. Yes. If, if you might. Um, uh, I think we are uh, running into the, uh, uh, getting to the, the end, unfortunately, uh, but uh, this has been very fascinating. What are you? What are your projects within the civil rights right now? What are you doing right now to uh, and, and, and you know continue this journey for civil rights uh, for for everyone? Is there anything in particular, any project that you're 
uh, going on or doing right now? Yeah, right now, uh, I, I feel that in the state of Florida that they are working hard to suppress votes so that people will not have a voice. And I believe that uh, more than anything that people need to be able to express their voices. So I have been uh, working with uh, voter registration. I've been working, trying to make certain that uh, people understand the, the what's happening in Tallahassee, what kind of legislatures, le legislative legislation that they are trying to uh, put forth in this next uh, session that begins uh, on Monday. So I have been trying to make sure that as many people as possible, possible are aware of how important their voice is. Uh, let's see, we just have one. Um, this has been a tremendous honor for us. Uh, and we are so thankful to have you and hopefully it's not gonna be the first or the last time we're gonna be discussing uh, having a dialogue with you. Uh, for anybody who wants or wishes to buy your book or any of your books, uh, do they just go to your um, website? Uh, go, the only one that's on my website now is Brave Little Cookie. Uh, the others are being updated, but the, the uh, book for children that talks about uh, my experience is the one that I, I have on my website, bravelycookie.com. And also, uh, we are showing right now, uh, again, I want to thank you. We're really, really, this has been so fruitful. We had so many questions, and there are going to be more questions. So um, I've been told that you agree, and well, you told me, that if they have any questions to please um, uh, email you at lavonbracy at aol.com. And that you, you know, they further want to, uh, you know, continue the dialogue. This is not going to be the last time we speak, but I really want to thank you for being here today and for enlightening us or for being that courageous. Uh, we, you're a role model to all. And for everybody that came in and, and attended, thank you for your participation. These are the things that we love and we want to do some more. So. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, and I think this concludes this webinar. Thank you All so right. much, everybody. Thank you. Bye.